Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. Welcome to the Scholar Online YouTube channel. In this channel, we make videos on learning web development, learning web application development, e-commerce development, digital marketing. If you're new to this channel, please feel free to subscribe. You'll find the subscribe button at the bottom of the video that you're watching right now, that red button over there. Please subscribe so that you will always be informed and you'll get notifications every time we set up a new video in this channel. We have new videos on Wednesdays and on Saturdays. Also like this video and leave me a comment below and I will try to get to each and every single comment that is made on this video. Another useful feature that we have on our videos is at the bottom inside the description box. If you expand the description of the video, you will see we've got timestamps to um, interesting sections in the videos that we're making because we, lot of, we make a lot of long videos. So you don't have to watch the entire video. You can just read through the time step and read about the section that you're interested in and you can just click on that timestamp and it will take you exactly to that section and you can just watch that section and it's also useful in future if you return you can just go to the timestamp and click on the section that you want to watch again and also uh, in the description below guys we've got our links to our social media channels facebook youtube twitter please follow us there as well we some in this video we're going to continue where we left off about a week ago so I'm hoping that you guys had a Merry Christmas and a nice break away from work. But you know, on Scholar Online, we keep going. So we're going to continue with that project where we are building a web application using um, a Python, a specifically Django. But I remember what we discussed in the first video, we're not focusing just on teaching you how to use Django. We are focusing on how to teach you how to approach a web application project as a holistic, you know, project management approach and all the steps that you have to cover. So we are going to start with the project planning. So um, you should have your project divided into three sections by now. And the first section is the project planning. And we're going to see how much of these items we can kick off the to-do list today. And I don't want to make this video too long, but obviously, guys, remember there is timestamps below. You can just forward to the section that you want to watch. You don't have to watch the entire video. But we're going to start up with setting up our development environment, okay? So let me discuss our development environment a little bit in more detail. If you've been if you've been watching a couple of videos in this channel, we work with Python specifically on Ubuntu and um, I mean on Linux Ubuntu. Okay, um, we use this because it's sort of um, easy for anybody, irrespective of the operating system that they're using, to simply purchase a, a virtual machine on Ubuntu anyway. Okay, and we're going to be working with Digital Ocean, and I'm going to show you how to purchase. A, a virtual machine on Ubuntu there and sort of configure your development environment and then we're going to be working and running our code from there even though we run our code on our computer we're going to be running it from there in this way it doesn't matter which operating system you're using you should be able to uh, connect to your uh, virtual machine and run the Python code as we go along and another thing reason why I really like to do it this way is I want to actually show you completely how to build the project and deploy it and have it running as an actual website and sort of set it up on a domain and you know so by the time we're done we're gonna have everything running on a um, you know on the server and set up as a website and we're gonna go and visit it properly you know so in order to do that you you can't run a website off your own computer and then I don't like to build a lot of code on my own computer then at the end I try to sort of convert it or send it over to a different operating system if things mismatch then I have a lot of issues trying to you know get everything to align so I like to build from the beginning on the virtual machine and that's how we're gonna do things in this channel and a lot of our web applications we're gonna do them that, that way so it's just better for you to build a system where you're gonna deploy it okay so that by the time you finish building it it's just gonna be literally 10 minutes of getting it online and that's the approach that we're going to take um on this web application as well we're going to build it right we're going to deploy it so the first step is obviously 
setting up the development environment. There's a couple of mini steps in here and I'm going to cover them all at once. Okay. The first one, we're going to purchase a virtual server. We're going to set it up. We're going to install Python and then we're going to install Python Django. And then we're going to actually have a look at the sort of skeletal Django website that comes with it. And we're going to get it done very, very quickly. So let's head over to our digital ocean. Okay. If you've never used digital ocean before, just sort of search for digitalocean.com like that. Okay. And when you get there, just create your own account, you know, with a username and password. And then after you've done that, before you purchase a droplet, come back and watch this video because we will take you, I will take you through the process of purchasing the droplet properly because as you purchase it, you sort of have to set up the, um, you know, environment and everything. So rather purchase it with me. And just to mention at this point, I'm not affiliated with digital ocean. Okay. I don't have an affiliation code, I'm not getting paid for this, maybe in future I will, but currently no. And, uh, so you don't even have to use digital ocean. You can use any, you know, virtual machine system that you like. I mean, if you're out of South Africa, you can use even domains to see Rosetta. It's really up to you what you want to use. The setup process is pretty similar. Okay. So there's just main things that I will highlight as I go along so that you can use any platform that you want to use. Uh, and then you don't get it wrong. Okay. The first thing that you must not get wrong is the operating system. This is the most important thing because um, the operating system varies and if you use a different operating system than the one I'm using, you might have a bit of an issue following along with the tutorial later on because um, operating systems are different, okay? That's the first thing. So irrespective of what you're using, make sure you get the operating system right. The second thing, this one is not a must, but I highly recommend you try and find sort of like a location that's as close as possible to where you are located so that um, at least the same time zone so that you, you know, you don't have, you know, you don't have a lot of delays and your server is not very slow. Okay. Those are the two main things. If you get those right, then it doesn't matter, you know, which, which system you use. So over to, um, digital ocean, we created this account quite a while ago. I've deleted the droplet that was here. So I'm going to take you, um, through the process step by step, how to start this from the beginning. You will see at the beginning it says, uh, build your first project, get started with a droplet. You can either click that, but I like to make sure that I'm doing the right thing. So at the top there, when you click create, you see all the different things you can create. And then if you introduce this new app thing, I've never tested this. Maybe we'll do it in the future, but, um, you can do databases, spaces, DNS, domains, whatever. There's a lot of things you can do here, but we focus on the droplet and this droplet is actually what we want, which is the virtual uh, server. Okay. Where we're going to run our code, where we're going to deploy our machine. We're going to configure it the way that we want. It's basically like digital ocean is selling you a computer. They are selling you a computer that they are hosting, that they're keeping in their, you know, whatever computer farm some way and you are buying a little space of computer computing power and uh, hence they call it a cloud server it's not really in the cloud it's just sitting somewhere in there you know wherever it is they're running this thing from and then you can you can communicate with it and you can load your code in there you can do anything you want you can configure it any way you want hence um i think i prefer using working off of droplets now we're going to click on create a new droplet and then you will come to this page and there's different operating systems. Okay. That you can go for Debian, Fedora, whatever, but we want Ubuntu specifically and under Ubuntu, you will see there's different versions of Ubuntu. And sometimes I go for a lower version depending on what I'm trying to run and the code that I know works on a, on a certain version. But in this specific case, let's go for the, for the latest one, which is uh 20.04. Okay. Um, and then after that, you got different plans. You can go for the basic one. I think that's okay for us. All right. And then you've got the different pricing models. Okay. So because we're building this for educational purposes, I mean, we're not going to be running a major website with a lot of visitors per day, you know, so I don't need a lot of space. I'm not going to, you know, and you can always upgrade it later. So I always start at least for my development environment with a $5 droplet. And, um, over time, if the, if the website grows and I get more people, I can always upgrade from the $5 to $10 to 15 to 20. And you have that option. So if you select $5 now, don't worry if your website grows and you need more data you can upgrade it so you're not stuck with a small dropper like you would have to migrate data or anything like that so i'm going to stick with the five dollar one all right and then after that you get the place where you can select where you want your data center to be so the data center is actually where they have this computer sitting physically and again um you want to select a data center based on 
a location that is as close as possible to you so if you're in the u.s when i select maybe new york closer to the u.s if or san francisco wherever if you're in africa there's nothing in africa if you're in india perhaps bangalore but another thing that that, that plays in in into this as well is your um your data center is where the actual computer is located this means that uh, in case of a dispute in case of a um legal challenge let's say you get sued or anything like that you're going to be governed by the laws of that country so if you understand country laws and things like that um you might want to perhaps select a country that you, that the rules are more favorable to you or at least you have a better understanding of the rules and regulations so if you're in the eu you know you're stuck with london is the only one that's closest to europe but maybe you might even want to go further on and deal with India, for example, or, or Canada, because perhaps the laws there are more favorable to you and you understand that in the case of a dispute, if you get sued or somebody sort of freezes your data for your app, and if you're building a big app and you're, and you're building an app for a big company, this might be somewhere you want to sort of talk to your client. So I'm, so I'm sort of like, if it was a real project, you would have a meeting with your client and you sit down and you say, you know what, guys, what are the pros and cons of having this in the U.S. versus having this in Europe based on the rules and regulations, you know, do you understand the operating rules in the U.S. if they hold your data, if you get sued? If anything happens, you know, how, how will, you be, will your client be comfortable with their data being stored in Germany as opposed to Canada or whatever, you know? So this is actually a very, very important decision. If For development purposes, it doesn't matter. But if, if assuming there's a real project with a real client, this is something you want to have a long meeting with your client to confirm and make sure. And if if dom if domains or pseudos that they, I mean, if for example this um scholar or whatever uh, digital ocean does not provide a data center that is in your country that your client will be happy with. Maybe you end up using a local provider. Like in my case, Domains of Zero Zero is based in South Africa and I know I'll, I'll deal with the rules of South Africa. And a lot of my clients, sometimes even government clients, will tell you the data has to be kept within the country. So, you, so you're stuck with using Domains of Zero Zero. But because this is educational purposes, Digital Ocean is a little bit cheaper. I don't care about what my data is saved. I'm going to just use London because of the time zone where I'm at. They like to do their, a lot of this um, uh, droplets as well. They like to sort of do the, you know, uh, what do you call that maintenance runs, like in the middle of the night. So if the time zone is the same, the middle of the night in London will be the middle of the night here in South Africa as well. So uh, you won't have like your server going down in the middle of the day because that's the middle of the night in the US, you know, things like that. So Always choosing a data center that is in your time zone is always good for that reason alone, you know, maintenance. So I'm going to go for that. And um, after that, the last time we did this, I showed you how to create a, do a droplet with a password where you would just enter your password in there and you would continue. But today I want to show you how to do it with SSH keys, which is a more secure method of doing it. Okay. A password is easily crackable. And think about it this way. If somebody can crack your password, they will have access to your droplet, which means they will have access to your code. They will have access to your data. This is really, 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 really important. So I never, ever use a password login method. Always use SSH keys. What are SSH keys? You have um, a 64 bit. I don't know how, how many bits it is. Okay. But it is like a long, a private and public key. Okay. So you have different keys, the public and the private, and then you keep the private key to yourself and it's saved in your computer somewhere. And then the public key is the one which you're going to paste in here. Okay. So every time you then SSH into this droplet, your, the public key that is in the droplet will try and find the private key on your computer so that it can sort of like merge and the two keys connected unlock and open the droplet so you don't even put in a password you just need to have the public key that matches that i mean you need to have a private key that matches that public key okay so um let's go and say um new ssh key for example so this will take you through the process of generating a new key okay you can just like uh, ssh key gen what this does it generates a public and private key pair so once you've set, generated those two key pairs then you take the public key you copy the public key uh, using this uh, phrase over there cat whatever you copy that key and you paste it in there all right and the public key doesn't matter if people see your public key you know it's it's the 
or the, the front end facing part of the key. Anybody can see your public key. It's like in cryptocurrency. Everybody can see your public key. It's available for consumption. It's like your account number. Okay, you can share your account number with people. The private key, now that's the one you got to keep private. Nobody must see it. It's only saved on this computer, on my computer. So I'm going to go and I'm going to copy my public key. All right. So if you go on, because um, I've already created a key pay. Um, so I'm just going to uh, copy the public key. If you do that, this sort of like um, cat, it actually just displays your public key. So this is my public key. You must paste, you must copy the entire thing, okay, from the SSH RSA part, the entire thing, even the, the end where it says pro local, you copy that entire thing and then you come back in here and you paste it as long as it is, you paste it like that, okay, and then it's pasted there. And then after that, you're going to give it a name and say, I don't know, whatever name you want to give it, do, 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 name it. But I'm not going to do this now because the last time I did this, I've already... Uh, pasted the key but once you've named it then you're done okay in my specific case i already have a key you see that school key actually if you, if you hover over it you'll see i've already pasted it is the exact same key okay so once you've done that um i know that i have the private key saved on my computer so every time i ssh the, it will just sort of unlock itself you know um I won't even have to do anything else. That's all you need for the SSH keys. And then after that, let's name this. Okay, let's name this Scolo. And then you can have any text that you want. If you want to create backups, this is another thing you want to discuss with your clients. Backups are very, very important, especially when you get hacked or you get like sort of uh, a lot of these, um, you know, like data, what, what am I call it? Um, you know, like... Um, you know, like when they hold your data hostage and they delete everything and then they're like, you know, oh, if you want to get your stuff back, you must pay us like one Bitcoin, you know, backups are useful for that kind of stuff. You know, you sort of like, you know, fuck you with your one Bitcoin, you just go to your backup and you restore your droplet. Or sometimes your data get, gets corrupted or so perhaps with a software upgrade, things go haywire, you know, cr computer crash, a lot of things happen. And if you've been in IT for some time you will understand that the backups actually a crucial part of, of, of your thing. I'm not going to do it in this case just because of the, of the fact that, you know, this is for educational purposes. But if you had a real client, this is something you'd want to discuss with the, with the client and make sure you obviously include the cost of the extra, you know, because it looks like it's 20% of the actual, you know, droplet price. Um, you include it in your quotation or your pricing. But backups for me is essential when you're running um, any type of... Um, you know, online thing. And then I'm just going to click create droplet and then it's going to go ahead and it's going to do its magic. Allocate me a droplet, um, in the location that I chose, it's setting it up with my SSH keys. Um, it's basically building me a computer or just allocating me computer space based on the specifications that I purchased. And I'll be paying for this droplet $5 a month. Okay. The droplet has been created. The only thing you need is this number over there, 178. That's your IP address. So this is the IP address of the computer that they've given you. And every time you create a droplet, you will have a different IP address because they're basically giving you a your own sort of computer up there. So I'm going to copy that IP address and then I'm going to SSH into this droplet. And by SSH into it, I mean from my command line, I'm going to log into this droplet from my computer and start working off this droplet and doing whatever it is I need to do in it. So I need, um, not that one. Let's just create a new, a clear, um, you know, uh, what you call it, a, a command, you know, like this is like the terminal. So a clear terminal window. And then you basically, you just type SSH um, root because currently when you create the droplet, the root um, account is, is, is the default and that's always there. Um, so the first step is that you need to then create a new user. You don't want to run commands as root. You want to create a new user and then give that user pseudo user privileges so that you can then run your program under the different, the new user. Okay. And this is part of setting up a droplet. And I think we've got a video where we go through this again in details, but I'll go through it again here. So we say root at that, that IP address. I just copied it and then I'm going to paste it there. That's my IP address. So what this does is that it's logging into this, to this uh, machine uh, from my computer. This is why I do not use a password because if I had used a password, anybody from their terminal could just say SSH root and whatever. And if they could guess my password, I mean, they could have a program running that's trying 
a thousand passwords a day and if you're using i mean it doesn't matter what how complex it is at some point they want to crack it but with a private public key it's much more secure they're not going to crack it crack your keys anytime soon the only way anybody's logging into this machine of mine is if they have the keys set up in their computer so you need to make sure that you have that so once you do that ssh root at that um um it's saying authentication of host. So the first time you do it, it will ask if you trust this host um, because obviously you're gonna be sharing a lot of information. Not only are you SSHing to that host, that host can also SSH into you, you know? So they can also sort of like, and this is how a lot of people get hacked. People sort of like just SSH into their computers if they're online. And technically, if I am online, anybody can, you know, log into or SSH into my computer if they knew my password and do a lot of damage and harm in it okay so i'm gonna say yes i trust them because i just created this i have to actually type in yes all right so i've added this this means that you know if if this was not a trusty a trusted ip they could also do damage to my computer but i'm happy with them and then for my specific private key i set it up with a um with a password you don't always have to do this but in my specific case i sort of added that extra protection over and above um, the SSH, I still have to put in, okay, so I, I'm, I'm forgetting my password. I think, I think, I think that's the one. All right, that's the one. And you'll see, let's just clear this and bring it to the top. You will see I'm now root at Scolo. So root is the user and Scolo is the name of the, dro of the droplet or the virtual machine. If you remember me creating the virtual machine and calling it Scolo. So I can now run commands as um as root but remember i don't want to um i don't want to run this um you know i don't want to run my program and my pattern under the root username okay because imagine you were you're like a company you had multiple developers you want to have you want everybody to have their own username and password that they use into my computer even your own computer at home you have your own username that you log in and you don't so that everybody can have sort of like their own you know how they how they log in but anyway um i need to not create a new user and how you do that very very simple you just say add user add user and then you can call the user anything that you want okay i love using names that i remember so i call myself zatosh so i'm going to add a user zatosh okay and once you've added the user it's going to ask you for a password okay so let's just put in a password and it'll ask for the same password again uh let me see i think i typed it wrong and if everything is fine, it will um, it will do that. And then my my name is Zatosh. Forget all of that. You can put it in if you want, but it's not necessary. This information is correct. Yes. Okay. So I've just created a user called Zatosh. And after you create a user called Zatosh, then you wanna grant that user um, pseudo rights, super user rights. So pseudo means super user do. So you want to create, you want to give the same user super user rights, but you don't always do that. But in my specific case, because this is going to be the main user that is running all the programs that's going to be installing stuff. I want to, I want to give myself super user pseudo rights. And to do that, very, very simple. You say user mod, this command modifies the user, um, par, par, you know, parameters. So we're modifying that to, um, to say um, sudo, sudo Zatosh, like that, okay? So this will give um, Zatosh sudo rights, okay? That's done, all right? And then after that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to then um, switch over and actually like log in as sudo, I mean as Zatosh, okay? And I can do that from the root, from the root login. So what I do is just say switch user Okay, so as you will switch user, so you will switch from the you from the root user, and it will switch to the Zatosh user. So I wanna switch to Zatosh. Okay, so what this does is that it will now, yeah, switch to Zatosh, and um and you'll see immediately even the prompt changes. It's now Zatosh at Scolo, no longer root at Scolo. Remember before you had that root at Scolo. Now we are Zatosh at Scolo. So currently I am running commands as root. Okay, so what I want to do now as well is to um what i want to do is to also load the same uh public key that i have here so i want to load the same public key on the root i mean on this zatosh account so that i can also ssh into zatosh currently 
even though I've added it when I created the droplet here, it's actually only added into the root account or the root user. So I can SSH as root, but if I want to now, I can't always be like logging in as root and then switching user. I want to be able to log in directly as Zatosh. And in order to do that, I must also SSH as Zatosh and SSH as Zatosh using the public key and the private key which I have in my computer. Okay, so in order to do that, there's a couple of command lines and I'm going to just show you here quickly. The first one is we need to create a directory that is called SSH. Okay, and to do that is, is very quickly, it's very easy, mkdir, this command creates for you a directory, a directory, all right, and um, we're going to create it from the main, I mean the, you know, from the bottom, and we're going to call it .ssh, okay, so we're going to create a new directory called ssh, that's it, all right, so that's done. After we created a directory called ssh, we're, done, we're then going to create a file in there inside the directory called authorized keys. You must call it authorized keys and it must be inside the SSH uh, folder. Okay. If you don't do it like that, it won't work. That's just how the Ubuntu machine is sort of um, configured or you have to do it that way. You can't give it a different name. You have to call it um, authorized keys and it has to be in the SSH directory because that's where the Ubuntu will look for the key. So uh, in order to do that, we're going to uh, start with Nano. What Nano does is that Nano is obviously the default code editor that comes with um, Ubuntu, um, you know, um, Linux. So if you click Nano, it's going to open the Nano editor. But you can then uh, type the file name that you want the Nano to open the editor in, which means whatever you edit in here will be saved in that file. Okay, so I'm going to say Nano and I'm going to go back to the same directory. Um, which is a dot SSH, sorry, that's a dot SSH. So this is just the directory I created up here, okay, when I made directory. So I'm going to go into that directory, and inside that directory, I'm, I'm going to create a new file called authorized. Um, underscore keys. Okay, so what this command does is that it opens the nano code editor, Inside this directory I just created and gives it a file name called authorized keys and you must call it this. So just make sure you copy and paste these commands exactly as I've written them, okay, if you're in doubt. And once you do that, you'll see we are now inside the nano code editor. We are no longer on the command line. So I can type things in here. This is a code editor. I can do whatever I can enter and type a lot of other things. This is a code editor. So in here, instead of typing what I'm typing, I want to actually paste the keys. Remember this key, the, the keys, these ones here, the public key, all right? I just need to paste that public key in there as it is, all right? And uh, don't worry about it. It's paste as one line. It's all there. If you go back, you'll see that it's all there, all right? So once you do that, once you finish with that, it's just control X to close that um, file. It will ask uh, save modified buffer. And then you click Y, which is yes, all right? And then you'll see name to write the file. Home Zatosh. Zatosh is a username and home is where you start. So under home, the username Zatosh under the directly dot SSH. All right. And remember the directly dot SSH. If you remember how directory file naming works, um, if you create a file called SSH or a directory called SSH, it's visible to everybody. Everybody can see that directly. When you list everything in the directory, you can see it. But if you, if you append the directory with a dot in front of it, it makes it like an invisible directory. It's there, but it's invisible. So people, if they list items in that directory which have a dot in them, they don't see those things. Unless if you specifically look for it and you want to see it, you will see it. It's just, it makes it easier for people not to make mistakes and edit that file by mistake because it just sort of, it creates that file, it puts it there, but it's like an invisible file, but it's still there. That's why we have the dot on top of the SSH. And then after that, that is the name of the file of the document authorized keys. Make sure that you get the spelling right because you have to name it exactly that. And then if you're happy with that, you just press yes again. All right. No, actually, no, you don't press yes. You just press enter. Sorry. And then it has saved that file in there and um, you're good to go. So you can now exit this and you can test if this works. If you exit, you're going to exit back into root. So you're now in root and you can exit again 
and you're gonna exit completely out of this VM. And now we are back at Matsiri's MacBook. So I'm back in my own computer. If I clear and I LS, I'm back home. These are all my files in my computer. So what I want to do now, I want to SSH back into the, the Zatosh user that I just created off the, um, uh, this IP or this, this machine, okay? So I'm gonna copy that in there and I'm going to say SSH um, Zatosh, which is the username, Zatosh at. So it's a username at the IP address like that, all right? And provided everything goes well, you should be able to, uh, to see your password for that key that you have in there, all right? So the password is um, whatever I, I did set the password to be like, and um, that's it. Then now we have logged into Zatosh Escolo and you've just set up your um, virtual machine um, ready to start running commands. So um, if we go back to where we were and, and, and had a look at our couple of things, we've already purchased the virtual server. We've already set up the server the way it should be with a user with pseudo user privileges. Now the next thing to do is to install Python, virtual environment, everything, and then we're gonna install Django. And for that, I'm gonna use a tutorial that I will follow, which will make it easy for you to remember everything I've done. So you don't have to remember each and every single command that I'm going to be typing. I found a really good tutorial online. And yes, as usual, it is a digital ocean tutorial. I love digital ocean tutorials. They're so well written. Um, so let me find where it is. Um, it is here, okay? All right, so let me just actually put this there, right? So that it's next to whatever. So this tutorial, I will link it in the description of the video or in the course content so that you'll be able to find it later and um, follow along as I've done, okay? So this is a tutorial for setting up Django with Postgres and Jinx, G Unicorn and Ubuntu 20.0. In Ubuntu. 20.04. If you're looking, you if you were working off a different operating system, you could just click on this tutorial there, and you could pick a different operating system, and then it will change the uh, you know the tutorial to be specific to that operating system. And this might seem like a little bit overkill, but remember what I said to you at the beginning is that I like to build my code in the way that I'm going to um you know run the the you know the or deploy the program at the end. And I'm going to deploy it within Jinx and I'm gonna use G-Unicorn to run the, you know, the, the system files. So um, we might also just install everything and follow the tutorial and do it the right way. You know, some other Django tutorials you'll see, you know, you, know, you only need to sort of install Python and then set up, um, you know, Django and then you're good to go. You know, but we're going to install everything at the beginning. We're going to install Jinx. We're going to install all of these because they're all necessary. The Django is the, is the, you know, the platform that we're working from, the Python, you know, um, web application, um, you know, framework. Postgres is going to be the, um, the database that we're using, okay? You don't have to use Postgres, but if you're going to do this for um, non-development courses, if you're going to do this for, um, if you're actually going to deploy this in an actual, uh, you know, website, you can use the development, you know, mini SQL database that comes with uh, with the Django. You actually have to get a proper database like like Postgres to work with because it's it's it's, it's you you're, you're gonna deploy this and it's you know it's for production purposes. Jinx. Um, the purpose of Jinx uh, is to actually, you know, it's it's like your proxy, you know, HTTP, uh, whatever. It's the one that helps you, you know, serve this over like a domain name, like you know, what when we create our website, whatever we're gonna call it, www dot find a job dot co dot za. We're gonna use Jinx to set up that, uh, you know, web server so that we, it's to talk to our Django application via G Unicorn, and um, you know. Uh, to serve it on the internet. So that's why we need Nginx. And um, Gunicon, obviously, it's a system, you know, it's the one that's gonna help us run this like a, like a proper, you know, production system file, um, where, you know, it, you know, it will be more resilient than just running it and, and shutting it down every, every so often. So we need this whole stack. I call it like a stack. It's like a, it's a Python stack for creating, you know, like full stack. It's a Python full stack for being able to build a Django application and deploy it on the droplet. So this is why I want to follow this specific tutorial. We won't follow it all in full. We'll go into it sections by sections as we need to, because I don't want to confuse you completely at the beginning. So let's just start initially by, um, they'll tell you overall that you need to have already have set up your, your droplet, which you've already done. And then we need to start by, um, 
so by installing Python. So that's the first step. And you would install Python whether or not you were going to deploy this application. And uh, just keep in mind, if you read this tutorial, there is instructions for Python 3 and there is instruction for Python 2. At this point and working off Ubuntu 20.04, there is absolutely no reason why you would want to use Python 2 at all, unless if there is, the only time I've had to use Python 2 is if there's a library that I want to use that is, hasn't been built for Python 3. And I've come across cases like that. So depending on what application you're building, especially the crypto stuff, you know, you get to some libraries that have not been upgraded for Python 3, but it's rare. And it means if you find that kind of library, it means they're not updating it regularly and you probably shouldn't use that library. You should use another one. Most libraries would have been upgraded for Python 3. But if you might have your own reasons why, you know, or maybe you've got a container that you're running that is only set up for Python 2. Whatever it is, you might have a reason that forces you to use Python 2. And I've had reasons in the past. But technically, if all else is equal, you want to use Python 3 because it's the latest one and it's more, you know, it's going to have, you know, a lot of improvements from uh, Python 2. So in order to do that, um, we, I'm just going to basically copy and paste this in this 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 command here so the first one is we're going to update our our packages and uh let's put in our password in there and um update our packages for um ubuntu 20 and once we've done that the next line while it's doing that we can just copy it from there and all the way to the end and I'm gonna paste it first and then I'll show you what, what this is installing. So this is now using the, you know, the apt uh, package to install Python 3, uh, pip, Python 3 development. This is Python development tools. This is PostgreSQL. So this actual database we're gonna be using and that as well. And then obviously in Jinx, it's, it's our, 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 you know, web, our web server and curl as well. So, um, so it's gonna install all of this all at once and you can say yes and all of that will go through. So, provided you don't have any errors, you don't have to do this again. This is for Python 2, remember that. Then we're going to go at the bottom and we're going to set up our post PostgreSQL database and user. So, the, the thing, what we need to do here is that we need to, first of all, create the database that we're going to be working with. And we do this outside of the Python program. You have to create the database outside of the Python program. You have to create the user outside of the Python program. You have to create the password of the user outside of the Python program. So you, so that you have a database, a username and a password. Then you're going to use these functions inside of your Django app in the settings to sort of be able to connect to the database. But by the time you connect to the database, the database has to be existing and you have to create it outside of the application. That's why we're doing it like this. Okay, so we're gonna, for us to do that, um, we're gonna first of all use this command to um, log in. Okay, so it's still um, building that. Let's give it a moment. Okay, so that's done. So once we've finished doing that, let's just clear all of this and put, you know, the prompt back at the top of the page. So the first thing that we, um, okay, so we need to copy that and paste this so this sort of logs us into the into into the into into the database so if you do that you will see now the command line has, has shifted you are no longer up there you are now running commands inside of the post postgres um, database so the first thing we're going to be doing is to i'm just going to copy that as well without that okay just to create the database and give it a name and what i like to do with my projects is Decide what I want to call this project and then use the same name with different variations as I go along because um, I don't want to forget what I called the database and what I called whatever. So I'm going to just call everything Scolo. Scolo user, Scolo, Scolo, and assume this, is a, this project is going to be called Scolo. So we're going to copy that and create a database called Scolo. All right, and uh, remember, similar to SQL databases, you have to put always the semicolon at the end of a command, and you will see it will say create database. It means that are successful. So once you've done that, um, then you're gonna create a user. Okay, you're gonna call, give it a username and a password. Don't just paste this command as it is. Every time it's highlighted, it means that highlighted part you need to change to you to what you want it to be. So I'm going to just uh, copy the create user part. Okay. And I'm going to call this color user just because I don't want to forget what I called everything. Okay. With password. All right. 
with password and I'm gonna call it password again as well all right do not do the same as what I've done please give it a secure password at least a 10 digits long complex password but make sure you've written it down because you don't want to forget what password you've selected but for educational purposes and making for the making of this video and I will delete this droplet as soon as I'm done with it I'm going to um, just call it password All right and click enter and then the role has been created perfect then once you do that there's a couple of lines here and they're just sort of setting the time zone you know and a lot of other things you know and I'm gonna just copy them all one by one and just do it with me as I go along okay so alter role um, for this user which is called a user you need to set the client whatever to UTF-8 okay so alter role scroll user and paste that all right then that's fine the next one is alter the role and um, we are setting some other this is just default stuff just 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 do it as it is don't worry about it don't overthink it at this point and um, scroll user that is, that's the one and just sort of copy it as it is set all of that not forgetting the semicolons at the end all right and we'll say auto roll then you know that's done and then the last one over there is uh, setting the time zone and set this time zone to your time zone all right scholar user all right and I know this is not my time zone UTC but it doesn't matter I mean it matters but I'm not gonna worry about it now and then that's it then once you've done that um, we then um, sort of the, the user that we've created we give that user access to the database that we've created then after this whenever we run commands inside of Python with that user that user already has uh, permission so um, that's what this command does we're granting all privileges on this database that we created called Scolo all right so this database we created called uh, S Scolo um, we're granting the you know uh, the users to whatever the Scolo user so let's just type that to scroll low user. So this is that user over there. We're giving them permissions to be able to use or privileges to be able to work on the scholar database and it will say grant and everything as well. Then after that, just log out of the, uh, the database like that and you'll see you are back on the, on the prompt. So our database has been set up with a user, with a database, with a password we're now ready to go and create our Django project so this is where we are now if you look at our to-do list we've done Python 3 actually we haven't installed Python 3 yet okay so that's what we're going to do now okay we've done the database so let's install Python 3 you need just these two commands over there right and remember we're doing Python 3 not Python 2 so don't copy this and then copy that just copy that at the, at the top it's either or okay so either that, let's do that. It's going to upgrade pip for us. And then after that, we're going to install, uh, use pip to install virtual environment, okay? Which is the second line. And then we're good to go, all right? So I'm going to clear this and go back to the, to the top. And after we've installed all of that, we can now create a project directory and then start working off the project directory, okay? I know this says my project directory. That doesn't mean you must use the exact same name. You can call it whatever you want. And I've decided to use the name Scolo, so I'm going to call this project Scolo. But if you look over here, there's basically nothing in here, um, except obviously that .ssh directory we just created, which is invisible. That's why you can't see it. Um, now, what we want here is um, we want to, the, the way I like to work with my droplets, I know I might have multiple projects in the future. And that's a nice thing about working with, a virtual machine you can do a lot of things on a virtual machine so I don't like to create my project files in the root of my user you know so I want to create like a development folder so I'm gonna say mkdir this is where I'll put all my development files okay and inside the development folder then I will create the projects I'm working with so that I could have other the other folders in here that I do other things with all right so I'm gonna mkdirdf and then I'm gonna immediately cd into that and cd into dev into dev folder and then you'll see i'm in the dev folder now okay and then in the dev folder then i can have the project folder name that i want to work with so i'm going to say mkdir um uh, scolo all right and um and and cd scolo so double end 
okay and see this color all right so i'm gonna call this color there it is so if you see over there there's nothing in there but under dev scholar i've created this and instead of scholar because i'm gonna be working with git uh, i know we're not gonna set it up in this project i mean in this video maybe we'll do it in the next one but to work with git you actually need um you need both um what am i call it you need like a repo and 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 the file and I, i'm just used to doing it this way you don't have to but i'm just this is how i'm gonna set up mine i'm gonna just ask mkdir um a folder called repo and a folder called um scholar again all right and then i will cd into scholar like that all right then after i've done that i'm now in here um, I can then create my virtual environment. Okay. And to do that, I just need this, this over there. Okay. Virtual ENV. I'm going to call it Scolo ENV. All right. And then it will go and uh, create a virtual environment called Scolo ENV. Then after that, you can then run this command to activate that virtual environment you've just created. And to do that, that command is source Scolo ENV then activate like that okay and you'll see if it's activated it will be like in, in, in at the beginning of your prompt and then you know everything you're running in here is now being run inside the python virtual environment and i mean if you've coded with python and it's not a python tutorial you understand running applications running programs in python you always want to work inside of a virtual environment not you know uh generally uh, installing everything in your entire computer because you want to separate the versions of the libraries that you're working with between the different projects. You might have one project where I want to use a certain version of a library and another project I'm going to use a different version and I don't want the versions to clash. So every time you create a project, you create its own environment. And inside that environment, you can then load all your, your libraries in there that you're working with. So once you've done that, um, I'm going to, these are all the libraries I need. For now, okay. I'm installing and I'm gonna go through it Django, G Unicorn, and that and that, okay. So let's copy that and paste, um, paste it in there. It's now installed. And now, when you're inside the virtual environment, you don't have to say pip3 again because um, this is a, a Python 3 virtual environment, and by default, it knows we are in a, in, in a Python 3 virtual environment. Just say pip, it will install the library that is for Python 3. But if you were um, if you didn't have a virtual environment and you wanted to work with Python 3 and you had both versions, you would use pip for installing libraries for inside the Python 2 and pip3 for installing libraries inside the Python 3. So once you've done that, um, we're going to start creating um, our first project, okay? And this is going to be a little bit confusing, so I'm going to redo this a little bit. You, if you have to run everything inside of the directory you're working with, inside of your working directory. So my working directory is Scholar, so then I, I don't have to then, you know, tell it where to create that because I'm already inside of my working directory. The only thing I need to run is Django admin .py, okay, and start project. It will start a new project. And then I can give it whatever name I want to call it. Okay, so that's all I'm going to copy. Just the first part. Django admin .pure start project, and I'm going to call this Scolo uh, app. I'm going to call this a Scolo app. And then click enter, and then it's going to create that. And you don't see anything. You don't know if anything has happened. Let's just list um, ls. We'll list everything that is in the directory that we're in. And um, you will see you now have two different things. You have Scolo env which is the environment, and then you have the Scholar app, which is what we've just created now, okay? Let us now cd into Scholar app. All right, let's clear this, and let's list this as a list like that, and you'll see now you've got a couple of things. You've got a manage.py file, and then you've got another folder, and if you cd into Scholar app again, you will see, and you ls in the you will see now you've got different files. So Django created all these files for you, and these are standard files that are created every time you you run that project that says uh, create um, you know create project. So every time you run this start project, so every time you run this start project, um, wherever that directory you're in and whatever you've named that project is going to create that directory, and inside that directory it will build all these files 
uh, WSGI settings, URLs, SGI, and these are all the files you need for Django. So you don't have to worry about creating your own folder structure within Django that's created automatically when you create a new project, okay? And then outside of this, um, it will also have uh, created for you this uh, manage.py um, file. And we can just sort of open this, click nano, uh, and and open and, and open this manager py and see what's in there even though what goes into the manager py has already been created for you by Django and um, if I were you I would not touch this file I would just close it and go back and follow the tutorial and see what else we need to do so there's a couple of things we need to do in the settings all right so the settings are inside the the new uh, project app that we just created so we need to go into scrollo app all right this is where the settings.py uh, file is, all right? So we're just gonna nano open this file, all right? So you'll see there's a lot of things in here and we're gonna be, every time we create a new app, every time we do a lot of stuff, we'll be coming back to the settings, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, file a couple of times. So the first thing is um, uh, we need to fix the allowed, um, allowed hosts. Okay, and um, we have to enter the IP of the computer we're working with as an allowed host so that we don't get errors with that. And this is for security. So let's just go back in here and, and look and find our IP address. There it is. And um, let's go and paste it in there under allowed hosts. And you must uh, uh, paste it as a string. All right. So you're going to paste it in there. So this is like a list. And um, the next, you, know, you need to also uh, uh, paste localhost localhost yeah. I don't know if this is necessary but um, let's say we've done that and then under the databases because we've installed a new database remember we, inst we installed that Postgre database so we need to change the default database that um, Django uses if you look underneath here You'll see it already has a database there. It already uses default engine Django backend SQLite 3. So it was going to create an SQLite 3 database for you. But this is sufficient for development. You know, so for development purposes, you don't have to change this. And it will create this database for you, SQLite 3. But um, we're doing this right. And we know we are going to deploy this application because we've got a client who wants this deployed. That's why we've already installed in Jinx. So we are, we, are, we are not going to be using the default database. We're going to be using the, the Postgres SQL database. So let's just delete everything in here and paste it as it is over there um, to use the correct database from the beginning. If you know you're gonna deploy the application anyway, there's no reason why you wanna use the, the basic database and then change it later. You can just have it right the first time. Then um, there's a couple of things. You can leave the port, okay? You can leave the host as local host, unless if you're connecting to the database of a different IP, like I could build this database here and run the application somewhere else, and then I, can, I would then have to change the IP. But in this case, then, then I probably would need a host as well. Um, so my user, remember what our username is, is scholar user. Scholar user, and remember the name of the database is scholar. So this is when we were doing the, if I can just take you back earlier on in the tutorial, when we were creating the database there and we, and we sort of created the database, whatever you called your database there, and whatever you called your user when you were creating a user with that password. So whatever the password you gave, whatever the name of that user, whatever the name of that database, that's what you got to put in here. So I called mine Scholo. I called the user Scholo user and I kept password as password. So that's okay. And then there's one more thing we still have to do here. Let's just have a look. Yeah, at the bottom, um, you need to, to, to um, um, under the settings of py, under that static, you just need to paste this in there as well. So we're gonna paste that in there and it says OS to path join, whatever. And if you're gonna use OS, you need to make sure you've, you've imported it at the top or else you're gonna get an error. So let's just go to the top where we're importing everything and just import the, the OS. So import OS or else you'll have an error running this. So once you've done that, you know, control X to close this, it will say, do you wanna save it? say yes and then when it will say is it a file name you want to save it as um just click enter and it will save that 
all right so you're done with that so after that you can then do our migrations okay so what the migrations do, do is that they create the database all the sort of the basic standard you know um uh, Django, you know, databases and user and the basic, you know, um, uh, you know, what you call it, like classes and whatever, they get created the first time you migrate the database. And every time you change stuff in your database a structure, you have to run the migrate command again. But the first time before you can do anything with your app, you have to run it for the first time. And in order to do that, you have to run a um, make migrations command. And the way you run it, you run it under manage.py uh you know uh python name so in this case we're not going to copy this as it is uh, because this is actually wrong what you need to do is that um you need to go um where the manage.py file exists okay so that you can be able to call this file all right and then um we can copy just the end part of it all right like that and then we need to say python because it needs to run under python so python needs to run this file so Python needs to run manage.py and run make migrations command in the manage.py file. Okay, so that's what you need to do there. So no changes detected. That's okay. Then you need to run then the migrate command. Okay, so we need to make sure we run Python. Okay, manage.py migrate, and then you should migrate your database. And if everything went well, you should see okay, 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 okay in green. You're good to go. All right. And then after that, we're gonna create our first user create super user so that we can be able to log into our database with it not our database but our like sort of our Django end with a super user so in order to do that again you need to run it every time you run manage.py um, file you need to run python in front of it even though in this tutorial they don't show it that way but that's how you need to do it so you need to say python then manage.py create super user it's going to create for you at least your first admin user with admin rights okay so let's click enter and then um what username do you want if you want to leave it as zatosh leave it blank that's okay i want to leave it as zatosh and what is the email address i'm going to say the email, my email address is admin at scrollo on online and what password do you want to use for this um i'm going to use this password is too common what this means is that my password is not you know it's not a it's not a complex password it's a very very easy password i don't mind because this is a test tutorial and i don't want to forget the password um, so I'm just going to say yes, override that, no, yes, oh no, okay, let me do it again. Yes, all right, then um, once you've done that, um, we're going to now then run this command to create our, our static folder, for the basic, you know, uh, you know, Django application and, and, you know, so that we can at least see something on our static folder with our, you know, like CSS, whatever. So let's um, um, run Python, all right, and paste that command in there, manager py and collect static, all right? 132 files collected, so you're good to go. So at this stage, you should be able to um, run your application and see what it looks like. Um, I didn't take you through the process of creating a firewall, Okay, uh, but there's another tutorial, another digital ocean controller that does that and shows you how to build up a firewall. Um, if you were just doing this for educational purposes, maybe it's not necessary, but for a client, it's a must. You must have a firewall. And every time you create a firewall, then you're going to close off all the ports and keep only the ports that you're running something on, like your SSH port and perhaps port 80, which is going to be your Nginx port. And... Um, you know, in this specific case, we need to allow port 8000 because we're going to run this application off port 8000. But because we don't have a firewall, I'm not going to run that command. But you should, and in a real application, you would have a firewall um, set up. And um, so um, in our specific case, we don't. And so we're just going to do manage.py run server on that port. Okay. So you're going to say Python first, manage.py run server on port 8000. And provided you have no errors and everything went well, um, you should see that. And if you see that, it means everything is good. So um, I'm going to copy that IP. 
So I need to go to this IP port 8000 to see my application. All right. So that's HTTP. All right. And I want to paste that and port 8000. All right, and provided everything run well, you should see the basic Django application. So we've set up our Django um, basic. Obviously, we're gonna change this, and we're gonna put in whatever the application wanna put in. But um, these are the steps. So this is the first part of the lecture is to just show you your development environment. So we've set up our droplet. We have set up Python 3, we have set up our virtual environment. We have set up Django and all the folders and the folder structure. We have, um, we're running our you know, default Django application. You can see it's running well. So if you get to this point, you have at least a basic Django application running. And um, I mean, if you wanna see this, um, but I don't wanna do that now, we'll do that later. But if you wanna play with this, okay, you can go back and have a look at how the folder structures change. Go have a look at your static folder, check your HTML files and see the HTML file that's serving this. Change it a little bit make it display something else, whatever it is you want. But we're not gonna do this in this tutorial for now, but perhaps it's homework between now and the next tutorial. Play around with the Django application. See if you can display different HTML files in there. See if you can, you know, see how the folder structure was put together because it was done automatically for you. And this is the main difference between Django and Python, I mean, and Flask, is that Flask doesn't do any of this for you. You have to set it up all yourself, but the beauty of Flask is then you can set it up the way that you want, okay? Uh, Django is very rigid. You have to follow this. I mean, the database is already done for you. You have to follow that whole process, that structure of how it's set up already for you. But with, with Flask, you could decide, I want to use PostgreSQL, or maybe I want to use... Um, MongoDB or MongoDB or maybe I want to use, you know, my favorite Rethink database. You can do anything you want with Flask because it opens up all these possibilities for you to work with anything you want. You can work off an API, whatever it is you want. But with Django, you know, the app structure is set up for you, okay? And one other thing I want to show you there, and I think we'll talk about it in the tutorial as well. If you go bottom, you can check your admin super user that you just created. So the nice thing that Django comes with as well is this admin portal. So this is like if you're in WordPress and you had WP admin, it's very similar to that, okay? Um, you can go to the admin portal and you can log in as an admin super user and then you can see the back end of your app. So, if, if, so when you start creating, and you'll see, when you start creating our tables and our database and our different data structures, you'll be able to see those at the back end, um, you know, of your, of your database, I mean, of your application. And this is really nice, and this is something Flask doesn't do. If you're working off of Flask, you would have to build this new back end yourself from scratch and have it display data from the database. But because we're working off Django, it's done automatically for you. So the, the user that I created, I think it was called Zatosh, and my password was that. There you go. So no, we're not gonna remember this. And you can see, this is my username, and I can change my password there. I can view the site, the front end of the site from here. You know, so this works. If you work with WordPress a little bit, this is like the back end of the WordPress site. Um, and this is done automatically for you with Django. That's one of the beauties of using it. But um, if you're working on Flask, you would have to have gone through the process of painstakingly building this back end myself um, of Flask. But obviously, I use Flask for different reasons than I use, Python, than I use um, Django for. So over here, you know, you can see your users. Let's click over there. Um, these are all the users that you've got um, currently. Zatosh is the only one, and I just created that. So the nice thing about this as well here is that even from the back end, you can add new data to your database from the back end. So I could add a new user here myself if I wanted, like add user there, and it would add a new user to the database, okay? So I'm not going to do that for now. Um, I'm just going to go back and not add a new user. But that's the beauty of it is that you can work off the front end or you can work off the back end. Okay. So going back to our to-do list, and I think I can safely say the first part of our building our application is over. We have definitely uh, finished doing our virtual, I mean, our development environment. So we're ready to go. We've got Python installed. We've got the Django files installed. We even have our app, even the back end, you can see this is our app. So everything is going according to plan. 
And I think maybe we might have a little bit, a couple more moments to do the project resources because I think this is an easy one so that from, uh, without, so we don't get this lecture to be too long. The next um, lecture, we will cover the rest of this. But today, let's have a look at project resources because that's an easy one. You'll see it doesn't even have subtasks. It's just one main task. Our project resources is, I'm going to show you the, um, what we're going to be using. So um, if you go to, um, I'm, I'm using a free template that you can also download for free. I could have used more complex pay templates, but I think I want you to follow this tutorial without having to pay for anything. The only thing you're gonna really have to pay for here currently now is gonna be your, um, uh, you know, digital ocean a droplet, which is like $5 a month. I mean, this is what, 80, 90 rand. All right, it's not a lot of money. And I think if you re you're serious about learning how to build this kind of thing, because you can charge clients. I mean, the difference between websites and web applications, once you start doing web applications, you can charge clients four or five times what you charge clients for websites. Because anybody can do a WordPress website. Anybody can do a WordPress website. But not everybody can do a web application. Because it's more complex. It's got the database. It's got the front. It's got the back end. It's got all of these other things. Interesting stuff that not everybody has got the skill set to do. So the skill set of doing a web application can greatly improve your earning power. Okay, And even if you go to like freelancing sites like Fever and other freelancing sites and you put up a gig there for doing a web application, you're gonna get more likely more clicks on that because there's fewer people that have this skill. So 80 rand, pay for that. That's the only thing you're gonna pay for in this tutorial. But after that, um, you know, I'm using a free template. So what I did, I just went to themewagon, themewagon.com. I think I'll put this link as well in the course content. And um, so go in there and, and look for job board and search for job board. There's a couple of job boards, um, you know, templates that you can work with. And they've got really decent templates for free that you can see. And I went through all the templates and I've picked one, unfortunately. So that's the one we're going to work with is this one here. I think I picked it because it's simplistic. And so I don't want to worry about the HTML and the CSS. We're going to work off this template. We're going to wire our Django backend to this front end. I don't even know what I'm, what I'm trying to say here. Okay, I'm going to take this website, this front end HTML, which already has, you know, CSS and everything because I don't, I'm not a CSS developer. I'm going to work off somebody else's CSS, but this CSS is just a front end. It has nothing at the back. Like if you try to search there, there's nothing there. It will say not allowed because there's basically nothing in there. All right. So um, you can select a region. You'll see these are hard coded in here. You know, select a job title. They're hard coded in here. What we're going to do is that we're going to build um, a back end in Django that is going to be talking to this so that when we, so that people can search for actual jobs that are existing in the database. And when they search, this search will bring up, you know, uh, results that are from the database. OK. And when we list these numbers here, when we list the top jobs listed, we're going to be listing stuff that's off our database. Currently, these is hard coded to the HTML is not because this is just an example template. But we're going to have these jobs listed in our database and we're going to be able to be listing them from the front. OK, we're going to have uh, what else are we going to be listing um, our, you know, CVs, our, you know, our portfolio, maybe even some blogs, you know, uh, companies. We're going to have a log in, log out. So we're going to do an entire you know, authorization, um, you know, coding, you know, loop where we, we, you know, you're going to create a profile, create an account, log in, have a profile of your, of your account. We're going to do all of that. We're going to, but we're going to use this template so we don't worry about the HTML and CSS. So what I want you to do is go to this uh, link right now and click on it and download this, um, this, this template. So this is the template you're gonna work from and spend, so I'm gonna end this tutorial, uh, this lecture here and give you some time to, um, to work off, you know, um, to just go through this template and, you know, and figure out, you know, how everything is connected, how, you know, what are the pages that are here, you know, um, look at the HTML code, familiarize yourself with the HTML code, check how many files we've got, you know. So I've downloaded this already. And if you download it, it will download in a zip folder. If you're downloading this for the first time, they'll ask you to provide an email address, which is simple. You can provide an email address and then they email you the link. They just want to make sure that people are not, they're not getting like, you know, spoofed or getting, what's the word, you know, uh, you get DDoS, whatever, attacks with, with, with bots 
um, downloading templates and slowing down their website. So you're gonna have to provide a valid email address and then they email you the link. So you're gonna so you download it off the of the email link. And once you've done that, so I've already actually downloaded this and I've opened the HTML file and I just want to show you a little bit of how it works. All right, so you'll see these are all the HTML folders. All right, and then you have the CSS, the fonts, the images, the JavaScript, the PHP. We don't need this. You can actually completely delete this, move it to the bin if you want, because we're not going to work off PHP. We're going to work off our Python backend. And then you've got a, a, a CSS. okay? So how we're going to work is that the CSS and the JavaScript and all these other ones, including the images, these are going to go into what we call the static folder. If you remember when we built the static folder earlier on in the settings, we're going to put all of these in the static folder. And then we're going to be left with the HTML inside the templates folder. So in the next uh, lecture, I'm going to be taking you through the folder structure of Django and how um, all of these can be structured inside that folders and how it's all going to work together. Okay. And next week again, um, what we're going to do as well is, um, I don't know if I can find this. Okay. So what we're going to do next week again is that we're going to work with um, the object oriented approach. And I think I'm going to skip the Saturday tutorial because there's a bit of homework to do between now and next week. So the first homework I've given you, remember, is go download this folder, go through the folder structure, familiarize yourself with this content because next week I'm not going to spend too much time dealing into the diving into the html i'm actually going to focus more on the python and the back end development so i don't want you to be stuck or confused with the front end html stuff all right then the next thing i want you to think about and a bit of homework between now and next week is our data structure so um if you look at our project planning we're done with um with the development environment and project resources the next thing is our object-oriented programming and in here we're supposed to think about the object classes that we're going to be working with that's the main thing of object-oriented programming so if you um, google object-oriented programming it's going to tell you this object-oriented programming OOP is a computer programming model that organizes software design around a data Okay, so the way we design the program is going to be designed around the data structure as opposed to designing it around functions and logic because there is obviously the opposite of object oriented programming is function oriented programming. Okay, function oriented programming designs the application and the software design and organizes the entire app behind functions and, um, you know, and and, and, and Flask, if you think about it, is a bit function-oriented in a way, um, up to a point, and you can choose how much function and object you want to work with when it comes to Flask. But with Django, you, you know, Django sort of forces us or leads us towards working with object-oriented because that's how a lot of the things are structured. So that's the approach we're going to use for this. And maybe we might have a mix here and there but it will be mainly, mainly objects. So what are these objects that we're going to be structuring our data around? The objects is going to be like, remember what is an object? An object is a data structure or a class. So think about it as a class. Um, and I think I made this example the last time and I said, imagine a car as a class. So a car can be a class of data and within that class, you're going to have variables, okay? So a variable within a car can be the color of the car, it can be the make, the model of the car. It can be the, you know, the speed of the car, the top speed, the acceleration rate, the engine type. All of these are different variables within a car. If you change the color of the car from red to green, you have a different car. Or you have, an, in, in programming, we'll call it a different instance of the car. Even though the car is the overall model or, or object type within that object type you can have different instances or different versions think about this way different versions of a car you can have car one which is red and is a make model toyota camry and then car two can be also red but maybe it's a mercedes-benz car three can be red and it's a it's a bmw those are three different cars there are three different instances of the car class okay so we're going to work with the same approach when it comes to programming we're going to have to decide from a high level what are the different classes we're going to work with and within those different classes we're going to create instances of the classes for the data for example 
Let me give you an example to help you understand this better. The user is already the first object that has been created for us. If you come back here and look at what we did over there, you'll see we already have a database and within the database we've got a, a user. And then this user has a username of Zatosh and an email address of admin school at online, first name, last name, we haven't said that, and the staff status is, is a yes or a no. Okay, so it says green, there are staff, which means they got super user access. So this is a user class or a user object. And for this user object, we could have multiple users. So there could be multiple instances of the same class. So the next user could be called Mary, and an email address could be mary at gmail.com, first name, Mary, surname, you know, whatever, Mary Payne, staff could be no. Okay, so you could so within this same class, we will we will have different instances of this class, and this class can form a table in our database. So that's why we're gonna focus our entire programming around the objects. So the objects are gonna be tables in the database. So the first table you could argue is the user table, and this table will have different rows, and each row is an instance of the data. And co each column of that table is a variable of the data. So this database has a variable username, variable email address, variable means this can vary, variable last name, variable status, and the rows are all the instances of all the entries that we will have in the database, okay? You understand? I'm, I'm interusing the word database and the word class and the word object because they're going to be related and they're going to work together as we go along. They are not the same thing, but I want to, to sort of help you understand how they're going to integrate into each other because our entire application is going to be based on this. So for you to understand Django programming and to understand app development, you have to understand object-oriented development and how the objects are going to then map into the database and how that's going to map into the application and how we're going to be able to see the front end. So somebody's going to be searching for a job. A job maybe is going to be one row. One type of job they're searching for is one row of the job table, for example. And then that job table will be mapped to the job class, right? And then maybe somebody will be looking for a job that is has a variable of a location, and that location is based in Cape Town. Then when we are searching, we're going to be using that to bring forth the data forward. So every element and attribute of our application is going to, talk to how we get, we put data into our database and get the data out but how it's structured we have to structure it so that we know where to find it when we're looking for it and how we're going to structure it is going to be guided by our objects right and those objects are going to be the different data sets that we will have in our application you understand I know that's a lot to mull over. You can rewatch this section a couple of times to understand it because this is very, very important. Everything we do from here onward is going to depend on your understanding of object-oriented programming. So the first object I've already explained to you is a profile or a user, and that's already created for us automatically when we created our super user, and the variables or the columns in there is a username, email, and password, right? The next object can be an applicant or a company, right? And the applicant can be a sub, it can actually be like a, an extension of the user object. So you can actually take the user object and extend it. And that's another thing you can do with objects. You can take an object that's a basic object, you know, an abstract object or whatever, and you can take that object and then you can expand on it. And you can say, oh, this is a user but then this user, we have a different type of a user that's an applicant, right? And that applicant will have all the elements the user has, but more added onto it. So we're going to take all of this. An applicant will you have a username, email, and password, but they'll have something else. They'll have a, an address, right? They'll have an address. Now, how are we going to see that? You can't see that anymore. Let me see that address. Uh, let me let me delete this. Uh, delete row so that you can see that. Delete this again. Delete row. Okay, that's better. All right. So they'll have a username and email and password, but they'll have an address. Okay, they'll have an address. Maybe they will have. You know, when you create an applicant, 
we're going to need an applicant to tell us about their previous job. Um, you know, so maybe we'll have uh, a jobs, you know, we will list the jobs that they've got and that will be another variable in there. How many jobs, have, previous jobs they've worked in. So let me call this previous jobs. Previous jobs, right? Maybe they'll have, you know, education. So this could be all the variables within an applicant, right? But um, a company, because we're going to register companies and we're going to register applicants. So let's say we have companies as well and we're going to allow companies to post their job requirements. So the company can also be a, a sort of like it can inherit of the user class. So uh, an applicant can have a username, email, and I mean, a company can have a username, email, and password, right? Right? But the, it will be different from an applicant because maybe we will then have a um, jobs, but this jobs is not the same as that jobs. This jobs is the jobs which they are advertising, right? And um, they might have payment status. Perhaps we want to charge companies for paying. So we need to record under their instance of a company, which is going to be a row in the database. Um, have they paid? And maybe we're going to have a membership type, you know, membership. Maybe we're going to have a membership type and a membership type could be, you know, are they, maybe they're going to be, they're going to have premium members, standard members, low members. So you have to think about all these things. And I'm thinking from the top of my head as I go along, and hence I want to give you this homework. I want you to go and think about all the different data object classes that this application might need. Okay. And are these data, these classes going to inherit of existing classes or they're going to be brand new classes of their own? All right. Or, you know, like a job, for example, can be a class within a class. So a job can be a class in itself, you know. So a job can be a job. It can be like, a, a, you know, what is a job? The title, the description, the requirements or whatever, you know. And then you could say that a, a, an applicant, this job that the previous jobs that the applicant has to talk about can be mapped to a job class. You can have that in Django as well, and you can have that in many data, data structures. You could have um, a class within a class. So we, we have a class called job, and this job could have, I don't know, it could have a title, description, title, description. It could have responsibilities, whatever, you know. And um, then you could say, when when somebody when an applicant is creating their own um, application, you know uh, their own profiles, and they mention their previous jobs, those previous jobs are going to have the same variables. They're going to have a title, a description, a responsibility. So they actually it's a class in itself. So a job actually could be another class. Education could be another class, and this class can also be a subset in another class. So. Every time you have a variable that is another class, I'm going to just put a different color there, call it, put it in red, and put that in red. And um, your homework is to go and think about all the other classes we're going to have. What other classes should we have in this application for it to work well? Think it through. And what application are sub, what classes are subsets of other classes? And there is no right, let me tell you this now, there is no right or wrong answer. Okay, you can design this whichever way you want. You could design this not even as a class and just have it as variables. And the previous jobs, you could even break it down and say job one, job two, job three. It's really up to you. And um, but how you do this planning will affect how you build your application, and it will affect how easily you're going to be able to search for data. It will affect how easily you're going to be able to display data, how easily you're going to be able to input data, how things are, are related and correlated, and, you, and, and, you, and that will come through in the end. But the reason why I do this at the beginning is because you have to have this pinned down. Before you even write any code, you have to think it through, because you don't want to think it as you're writing the code, uh, you want to have it thought through before you write the code and then perhaps you can refine it as you write the code But you need to have a plan, right? Hence I have this in the planning part of my project is to talk about the The data the the, the, the content management So this data is the, gonna be the content of your application and how you're gonna manage this content and what relates to what and what forms a class and what is what this is very very important and very very important to be done at the beginning and 
as I promised, I'm really going to end this lecture here because now I think I've covered a lot and I've given you a lot to think about. Think about all of this and get ready. I think I'm gonna get, I'm gonna skip Saturday and I'm gonna post the next video. Or, uh, I'm gonna do this a week later. So give yourself a whole week to think about you know um, all these things and um you know explore the da the data structure in here so you can close this and explore the data structure in here and how how all these folders are put together but also explore you know this folder this what we just downloaded off the internet you know open it up like you can just like for example open up the index.html uh, file let's just double click it it will open it for us and have a look at you know, the HTML, how everything is connected. Just familiarize yourself with this because next week, the next lecture, we're going to hit the ground running and assuming that you've already looked at all of this. And I will give you my answer or my how I would do it with the data structure. But that doesn't mean that that's the correct way. You know, find a way that works for you in structuring this data. Thank you.